Welcome everybody to our CEO club meeting today. This is actually our second virtual meeting. I'm hoping and praying it's going to be our last, but I really appreciate everybody taking the time to be with us. We really have a fantastic meeting plan. We're going to hear from our esteemed panel of Chris McDonald, Jim Rees, and Steve Terramino. And we're going to talk about sales, marketing, and business development in this COVID-19 marketplace, which is still kind of a crazy time for all of us. But for our guests that are here with us today, and we have guests from uh, across the country at other CEO club chapters, and from around the world, we've notified our international chapters about this event. So for our guests that are here with us today, let me tell you a tidbit, just a little bit about our club and what we're all about. We're found in many major cities across the country, but we're very, very heavily involved internationally. We have eight chapters in China, chapters in Korea, Dubai, the Philippines, two chapters in India, Singapore, Vietnam, Greece, and Egypt. The club itself was founded as a nonprofit way back when in 1978. And quite frankly, folks, that's why our dues are so very low, extremely reasonable. We do have a subset of the CEO club. It's called the Presidential Advisory Council, or PAC, P-A-C. I can assure you it's an advisory council. We are not a political action committee. Uh, we act as a board of advisors for one another. It's with non-competing companies. We sign confidentiality agreements, no more than 12 to 15 people. And we really act as a mastermind. We act as a, you know, as, as a sharing of information. I mean, it's a powerful, powerful group. You don't have people like you can talk to in that type of manner. I strongly advise you get involved with a group like that. Anybody's interested, just contact me after our meeting. I also like to recognize our sponsors at each and every meeting. They help to fray a lot of our cost. And uh, at our live meeting, they get to say a few words, but right now I'll just say their names. We have three platinum sponsors. Number one, Baltimore Business Journal with Rhonda Pringle, the number one source for local business news. Our other platinum sponsor, CCNA, Strategic Media, Steve Taramino, one of our panelists today. We do a fantastic job with our website, CEO Club website. We give you measured results. Can't say enough about the great job. And our newest platinum sponsor, Gary Stein with Studio 83. He's focused on your message and helps to impact your bottom line. Also, the Law Office of Vasilios Peros is a corporate sponsor. The legal counsel for your growing business, and he works with a lot of members of our CEO club. Also, Leonard J. Miller and Associates, certified public accountants with a great moniker, we count for your success. Merrill Lynch, the Pierce Group, Kent Pierce, one of the top wealth management practices in the region and in the country as well. Redbird Technology, Tim Smeltzer, your trusted IT advisor. Vehicles for Change, Marty Marty Schwartz, great, great nonprofit folks where you can donate your car, you get a great tax uh, deduction, and you really can help a family in need and change somebody's life. If they don't have transportation, and now they do. If you have a car that you're thinking about donating, please contact him. And our last corporate sponsor, Wexley Consulting, Ken Wexley. Ken is literally one of the top organizational psychologists in the country. And he works in the area of executive hiring and assessment, leadership development, and executive coaching. Okay, let me quickly just review some of the upcoming events with the CEO Club. And then I'm going to introduce our panel and we'll have our panel discussion. Our next CEO Club meeting, and folks, we're keeping our fingers crossed that it's going to be a live meeting. Mark your calendars, please, for Wednesday, September 23rd, back at Harbor Court Hotel for our next CEO club meeting. And again, we're hoping that's gonna be live. Our next PAC meeting, Presidential Advisory Council meeting that I just talked about, scheduled for July 30th. That will be live. I uh, checked out the conference room again. We have a much larger conference room. People can easily be six feet apart. We can hold our 12 to 15 people. So July 30th, there will be a live Presidential Advisory Council meeting. And finally, on August 17th, we're having our 19th annual Kristen Rita Strauss Foundation Yellow Dress Golf Classic. And I can't say enough for all the support from all the people we have with the CEO club. 
and you've really been a tremendous supporter of this foundation. We have raised over the years about $1.8 million. And, and the key thing is one of the programs that we support, it's called the Adolescent Depression Awareness Program through Johns Hopkins. And we have now trained over 115,000 high school and college age students on the warning signs of depression and teenage suicide because kids will talk to other kids before they talk to adults. Our goal there is to obviously train every high school and college kid across the country. So we thank you so much there. And again, if you're interested, see me after or contact me after the meeting. Okay, and before I introduce our panel, I wanna say a special thank you and a special shout out to Craig Weisbaum of Talking Tree Creative, as well as Steve Terramino who have done a great job in helping us to put this, uh, this virtual meeting together. Really a lot of stuff goes on behind the scenes, I can assure you folks. Thank you both. And also, uh, I'm gonna introduce the panel. Uh, we're gonna have a series of questions from me for about 20 or 30 minutes, and then I'm gonna open it up to the audience. So if you have a question, be patient, we will get to you. Well, let's meet our panelists, everybody. Chris McDonald, I'm a president of McDonald Consulting Group, a licensed Sandler training center based here in Towson, Maryland. He has over 30 years of experience in sales and executive leadership. Chris's company is a global training organization with a local focus partnering with businesses and individuals in a variety of industries to help them improve the effectiveness and efficiency of their sales, their management, and their organizational processes. Chris has a proven track record of success as a keynote speaker, award-winning trainer, and corporate coach. Welcome, Chris. Jim Rees is Director of Business Development at Offit Kerman. They are a full-service law firm serving the legal needs of small and mid-sized privately held companies. The firm has 230 attorneys in 14 offices from Charlotte to New York City with a heavy concentration here in, here in the Maryland, D.C. and Northern Virginia marketplace. Jim has access to a deep network of attorneys in every practice area. Jim is also a master networker, and he prides himself on being able to make meaningful connections, which he does. Jim, welcome as well. Steve Terramino. Steve is a keynote speaker and CEO of CCNA Strategic Media, a marketing communications firm based here in Baltimore. He has positioned his firm as a leading agency in marketing psychology and works with organizations throughout the United States, the UK, as well as Germany. He has been interviewed by CBS and NBC regarding data protection and the privacy policies of Google, as well as Facebook. He also works with the Maryland Attorney General's Office as an expert witness in the areas of SEO and digital reputation. And Steve was recently featured as a keynote speaker alongside Kathy Stavit, the Chief Marketing Officer of Yahoo regarding digital marketing, strategy, and tactics. I wanna thank you all for being here. And again, we're gonna be talking about sales, marketing, and business development in this COVID-19 uh, COVID marketplace, which is obviously still a crazy, crazy time. I'd like to ask, to kick it off, to ask each and every one of you, Steve, why don't you kick it off first? What is the one thing, the one thing that you can point to that has worked for you over these last several months in this crazy arena? Steve. Uh, thanks, Doug. I appreciate you having me on today. Um, you know, I think the obvious answer from the marketing and technology and, and advertising space is really about SEO and pay-per-click. Uh, but even though that's the obvious answer, I don't think it's the real or the right answer. Um, you know, the right answer is really about the holistic approach to new revenue. So each of us on this call represent a portion of the revenue arm of an organization. You know, at a very high level, you know, I'll define sales as really about asking for a commitment to continue the relationship. That could be in the form of a contract. It could be in the form of you know, a follow up or, you know, just going out for coffee. But it's about asking for a commitment. When you look at marketing, that's about brand building. It's about creating interest and curiosity. It's about lead generation, those types of things. 
And then, of course, business development, that's really about exemplifying the brand and representing the culture and then continuing relationships. So, you know, at that high level, you really need to use a balance. So just relying on sales or just relying on some sort of marketing is really a recipe for trouble. It's the organizations that are using a very balanced approach to sales, marketing and business development. Those are the ones that are growing throughout COVID. And, and it's going to require that type of balanced approach moving forward. So I started thinking about that and I, and I looked at it. I was like, wow, I, I definitely appreciate that. And you think about because it's easy to put our head in the sand. Um, it's easy to put our head in the, in the sand and think, OK, well, let's hopefully this will pass. Um, so our decision was to brace our clients early and often um, embrace the marketplace to make sure that everyone felt that there was a, a place they could go, a place where they could uh, not only gather, but to understand some people wanted to really double down on their current skill sets. And I'll talk about that. But the, I guess the one thing was, again, being there. My daughter, she's a sophomore at Delaware, so she came home. So she left her sorority. She left all of her friends. And then here's mom and dad. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. So breaking out the Uno games, breaking out the old Wii games um, and, and just really being there. So as I look about it, there are some blessings that have come from this uh, and, and then in closer relationships with family uh, it, during a crisis and with clients. So that's how I'd answer that. Love those comments, Chris. And again, uh, I mean, you touched on so many things, You're touching your clients, embracing your clients, keeping in contact. And then, of course, with your family, the whole concept where you really were touching on the concept of mindfulness, being there, embracing your family and embracing your clients. Thank you. Jim, give us some feedback. What is the one thing that's worked for you in this crazy marketplace? Right. Um, well, my main role as director of business development at Offit Kerman is to recruit clients to the firm. And I do that by networking and connecting people. Um, and so what I did immediately after this uh, pandemic started is I doubled down on my marketing. Uh, I saw an opportunity where crisis would bring opportunity for me and for the firm. And I wanted to be proactive. So rather than sit back and cut my marketing, I doubled down in my marketing activities. Um, in addition, what's been very helpful for me is um, I'm a true believer in if there are people that you want to get in front of, the best way to do it is create your own events and invite those people to your events. So I've created several virtual networking and learning events with partners and that way I invite the people that I want to be around to be at those events and I'm in front of them on a regular basis. And then thirdly, I would add that right, right off the bat, um, I took an attitude of empathy and uh, sent a message to all of my clients and prospects and friends and centers of influence and evangelists, just letting them know that I was thinking about them, I care about them, what do they need? How can I help? And I would say that the word empathy really um, describes my whole approach to uh, marketing and business development during the pandemic. Great point. Helping others. I mean, whether you're in a COVID-19 marketplace or whether we're, you know, in a regular situation, can't say enough about reaching out. And, you know, I guess the old commercial was reach out and touch someone. Remember that? Was, was that Coke or oh, Pepsi? Yeah. That's right. Jim, talk a little bit about, you know, it's a great idea. You invite people that you want to be there to event, but I'm sure not everybody shows up that you want to come there. How do you network in today's environment remotely? <clears throat> what what works in that pers perspective? Because people are either trying to do Zoom meetings or these type of meetings or, you know, doing telephone reach out. What, how has that been successful with you to network remotely? And what ideas can you give to our audience? Yeah, well, it's it's really important to uh, to uh, to ask for feedback from your audience, and then you'll really know whether whether you're hitting on all cylinders or not. But um, what I've done is again, I've partnered with other individuals to provide educational and uh, networking opportunities combined in you know in one event. Some of these are are smaller, more intimate events, and some some are larger events. Um, but 
besides the events, and the, the events have been great, I think it's really important for people to, um, uh, to engage in social media. Uh, as I've said many times, don't be a lurker. Don't be someone who just clicks like all the time, but actually engage, um, post on social media, comment on social media, uh, and people will see that you've, you've got a profile out there and people will see what you're interested in by your, the comments that you're making. Um, be an active participant, um, and that's a great way to engage. Uh, I believe that uh, we all agree that people do business with people we know, like, and trust, and I think you can get to the know and the like via social media. I think the trust part um, has to be um, a, a conversation off of social media where you're really cultivating the relationship to get to that trust piece. So it gets you to know, like, and trust, be active on social media, and then when you, when you get the relationship to a certain point, go off social media, do a virtual coffee, or some people are actually doing in-person visits now, um, you know, being very careful about it. Um, but that's, that's what I've tried to do. Sounds good, and sounds like it's still working. Chris, you know, sales is tough enough as it is. And now with the barrier of, you know, like Jim said, things are just finally opening up a little bit. Talk about the effect of the COVID-19. How has it affected the sales process? I mean, it's got to have got to have some effect and definitely in terms of slowing it down and the sales cycle and so forth. Comment on that if you could. Absolutely, Doug. And, and yeah, and it, it is it, the effect has been in, in multiple different ways. Uh, for some businesses, the effect has been uh, an overabundance abundance of front end leads, depending on the business that they have. Um, many businesses, though, to your point, uh, the adverse effect, everything dried up. So the front end all of a sudden completely dried up. Um, most people, a lot of people were in, in, you know, putting the head in the sand mode. So with that, for salespeople uh, and for, and for, you know, for companies, uh, sales management, it's all about identifying the ideal client, identifying the ideal prospect in today's world. That might be different than the, the pre-COVID world in many cases. And really um, being creative, reinventing themselves and understanding the fact that what they're looking at in the process and measuring pre-COVID, um, economy was going well. Uh, in some cases, sales were coming in um, despite some of the efforts to bring sales in. Maybe there wasn't a process. So now there's even a bigger need in many cases for that process. And from a standpoint of where deals are along the funnel, a lot of times it's around uh, understanding how these deals turn into results. What type of results do we have? Instead of in the process, focusing more on behaviors. It's kind of like Jim mentioned. So now the sales process turns into what behaviors can I do on a regular basis without focusing on results? focusing on behaviors, what can I do that will eventually get me there? Um, and then back to the ideal client, really understanding the territory, understanding who you can um, co-sell with and co-market with. Uh, Zoom gives us an opportunity, unlike any other time, to really embrace it, to say, because in the past, it might take for a sales process, it might take weeks and weeks and weeks to secure a face-to-face -face meeting, right? It's like herding cats. Now, more people that are available and with Zoom and other um, ways of video conferencing, you can get people, decision makers, breaking down those silos in a room much easier uh, and, and more effectively. So sales processes are actually shortening in some cases around that. So it's really a, a wide, um, a kind of a, a wide net as far as the differences in sales process, but it's all about behaviors. Yeah, and it's really talking about understanding your sweet spot, if you will. You know what I mean? I mean, the pipeline with a lot of companies I'm hearing has dried up. But you're saying that really the old axiom, find a need and fill it. And yep. you know, find the right client, whatever your sweet spot is, and make it happen. Steve, let's segue over to marketing a little bit if we can. You know, there's a lot of negative thought out there. They're going to be talking about the sales process. A lot of people's pipeline is, is dried up. But in every dark cloud, there's always opportunities. 
talk about some of the marketing opportunities that you know we all can have for the rest of this year. Uh, you know, um, I think Chris's comments are spot on. Uh, a lot of people pulled back. And in when it comes to advertising spend, especially digitally, most of that advertising spend is a bid system, which is very much required for a lot of different organizations to spend money for the bid system to remain high. So I think the silver lining in this specifically is for about pay-per-click, uh, whether it's on you know Google or anywhere else. It could be display ads, uh, YouTube ads. But because there's less companies investing in pay-per-click, which is by nature a bid system, the cost to advertise in pay-per-click has dropped substantially. And the space in the market for that type of advertising is now very wide open. Um, most people, at least the ones that we've been working with, that have been using pay-per-click throughout the last 90 days have seen about a 70% increase in lead generation um, at a much, much lower cost. So first, you obviously need to track you know, your customer acquisition cost as well as your cost per lead. And then once you figure out those costs per leads, if, if you're not using pay-per-click currently, um, you're probably seeing a very high cost per lead, but that cost should drop dramatically in an area like pay-per-click right now. Um, now, that's not to say that's the only place that an organization should be focusing when it comes to marketing and advertising, uh, but I think it's the area with the most opportunity right now. So you actually give the client the measured results. They can see what they're spending. They can see exactly what kind of response they get, and they can make decisions accordingly. Is that what you're saying? Absolutely. Absolutely. And of course, those costs and those numbers will change on an industry by industry and company by company basis. Um, but as a general rule, most every industry has dropped substantially in the spend and the cost per lead and cost per customer acquisition has dropped dramatically as a result. Knowing your costs, knowing your numbers, you know, if you're on Shark Tank, that's what they always talk about. <laughs> Chris, talk a little bit about, you know, Again, we're talking about sales. Things are drying up a little bit, but people still have these all these misconceptions about sales as well as salespeople. And what do salespeople need to do to move beyond those type of perceptions and be able to gain that trust that we're talking about that Jim mentioned, which is so vitally important in this marketplace or any marketplace? That's a great question, Doug. And, and I'll answer that. And that question has like probably about... 48 parts underneath the one I'm going to mention in a second, but it's really the key word is trust to your point. And there are misconceptions and perceptions, if you will, about salespeople. We all know that. Um, and if you were to think about some of the negative perceptions, we could make a list of, you know, pushy, um, you know, just arrogance, only selling for their reasons, only care about the sale. Uh, just, you know, showing up and throwing up whatever it is. And that's what scares a lot of people. So it keeps them and uh, in, in whether it's a, you know, an environment where it was face to face or video, um, it keeps them, it keeps prospects from being upfront, from being honest with salespeople because they don't want to be taken advantage of. So one way uh, inside of that is, and this is early on and, and it's to develop trust. Let's say if, if a salesperson is meeting with a prospect for the first time, no matter how they got introduced, if it was a referral or, or a cold call or an introduction, whatever it is. And this, the prospect goes to the salesperson and says, why should we work with you? Or why should we leave our vendor? Well, many times salespeople make critical mistakes. And what they do right away is start telling that prospect why they should. Oh, because we got the best this, blah, blah, blah. You should do this. You should do that. You should do that. And then immediately they put their guard up. Right. That person's trying to sell. No one wants to be sold to. I don't like being sold to. Uh, matter of fact, the stereotypical salesperson, I'm not too crazy about because they're focused on their needs. But I am okay if someone's going to focus on me. So if that salesperson in that scenario says, you know what, um, Mr. and Mrs. Prospect, as much as I want to tell you about all the different ways we've helped other customers in similar scenarios, I'm not sure that those reasons will match up with yours. I'm a little uncomfortable doing that. Why don't we back up a little bit? Let's ask each other some questions and we can really determine if, if there's a fit to work together. And if there is, then we can, we can take those next steps. Lower the boundaries, lower the guard, ask questions, be there for them, 
um, so that sale for so that customer feels comfortable. And that's one of the quickest ways to lower those negative perceptions. And again, understand the needs of the individual. <laughs> that's what they want. They want that consensus that they, you know there's some sort of agreement. Jim, talk a little bit about from a professional services standpoint. You know, how is those services sold without being quote unquote like Chris was talking about salesy to have that sales demeanor on? Talk about uh, that. Uh, yeah, it, it, this is a good segue because um, uh, you, you know there is a big difference between sales and business development, but they really should be complementary. They shouldn't be considered. Um, you, you know, as, as knocking heads in the same organization. They can work together and be complementary. Um, to, to, uh, uh, to Chris's point, um, oftentimes, too often, the focus of a salesperson is on themselves, not on the customer or the client. In business development, the uh, focus is always on the client. So uh, it, it's a little bit different approach, but again, I wanted I, I wanted to to uh, make sure that that I explain it that they should be complementary. They should be working together. Um, selling professional services is not easy because it's usually a very long sales cycle. So you have to have a lot of patience and a lot of tolerance. Um, what I do, I call it the ABCs of business development, and the A is uh, the first step, which is to attract prospects. And you do that by being active on social media um, and, and sharing meaningful and relevant content. Uh, the B in the ABCs is to build relationships and build lists. So um, start compiling a list of prospects, a target list that, that Chris talked about. And then the C is to eventually close business. And you can't do that until you've cultivated a relationship of trust. You also can't do that until there's a need. So uh, the, the, the closing the business, this uh, again, this is a long sales cycle. You have to be patient and tolerant, but it will work. It's a marathon, not a sprint. Well stated, a marathon. It's 26.2 miles, that's a long time. <laughs> Steve, chime in here if you could you know, from a marketing perspective, what do you see as the most common mistakes companies, individuals make when it comes to marketing? I mean, I love your concept of measured results. And I think most business people want to hear a little bit more about that. Yeah. So hmm, let me think about this for a second. Um, I think over the last eight to 10 years, um, specifically eight years ago, uh, CMOs and marketers, they all were really relying on technology. And then it evolved through technology into analytics. Um, and obviously technology and analytics, they all have a huge part to play. But I think the most common mistake is people get too overly, um, I guess you could say lost in the technology and lost in the analytics. And they don't step back to really understand their audiences. In our world, we call them segmentations or customer personas uh, and understand the psychology behind them. You know, what is this group of people expecting to see? What do they want to see? And then how do you create meaningful content and meaningful creative to attract that person or attract that type of persona? Um, you know, most of the companies that we've been working with over the last five, 10 years, they all, they all have been saying, hey, I need to get involved with SEO or I need to get involved with social media. And we really have to take them a step back and say, that's great. Uh, but you really need to identify the personas and understand what motivates them before anything else. And then once you have those motivations and you have that understanding and that psychology documented, then you can start looking at the tactics. And the tactics are those things that I just talked about. It's the SEO, the social media, the email marketing, the pay-per-click, the video, you know, all of those things. But they're nothing more than tactics. They're not strategies in and of themselves. Um, so the mistakes are made in people trying to jump into technology too quickly, or they're trying to jump into analytics without really understanding the psychology and the personas behind it. Wow, very interesting. Chris. Steve brought up an interesting point about tactics. He's talking about it from a marketing perspective. I'd like to address that from a sales perspective. A lot of people in our audience, you know, not only have salespeople, but they also have sales management. 
and sales managers, executive vice presidents, and so forth. But talk about the sales managers, if you could. What should they be doing if it's anything different in this crazy marketplace? And what is the difference, if you could, the balance between monitoring an individual, say a sales manager monitoring their, their salesman, and at the same time, how are they impacting the results that they're trying to achieve? Yeah, great question. And, and yes, there are definitely differences today as compared to pre-COVID, if you will. Um, at the same time, um, if there's a process that they were already following um, in their management process, then they would continue to follow that. I think some of the object, uh, some of the issues would be reluctance to engage technology for whatever reason and reluctance to engage video or something like that for whatever reason. And I think one of the things that where it really comes down to for a manager is to understand the following. If a manager uh, brings all of their say, salespeople into a room and they say, okay, right now, or, or in a Zoom room, if you will, write down your sales process. What are the odds, unless there is a process in place, that everyone writes down the same thing? Very slim. Very slim. It's like, uh, for example, uh, a head football coach, you know, uh, you know, we'll see if football co comes around this uh, this season. But a head football coach, imagine if it's at the end of the game and the head football coach brings the team over. There's 20 seconds left. They have to score a touchdown. They're done by five. The coach has everyone around. They're not going to say, all right, guys, go out, uh, run that thing in a jig we did a couple weeks ago to win the game. All right, go. They're not going to do that. He's going to say specifically. Foxtrot 864, do this, blah, blah, blah. It's going to be laid out. Everyone's going to understand that they're going to go out and hopefully execute it. Same thing with a sales leader. A sales leader needs to be able to speak the same language as their sales team so they know where, where the sales process fell off the tracks, where it got back on. Uh, and also, what is the sales leader managing? A lot of them manage, manage lagging indicators, results, reporting the news. Your sales were this, your sales were that. Okay, versus leading indicators, key performance indicators, behaviors. So it's really understanding how to connect with your sales team remotely, checking in with your sales team, making sure that they're connected with their goals uh, in a deeper level, understanding, as Jim mentioned earlier, empathy uh, and, and being there for them, uh, but, but really understanding their role, how do they add value versus someone that's going to report the news and say, here's where sales are, need to get them up. That doesn't add value. What is a couple of things, a couple of thoughts that you come to your mind and how they can really be utilize that to the best that they possibly can? Well, firstly, uh, you need to use social media. It's not a question of, you know, if you should or if you shouldn't. The answer is you should. Uh, there are many reasons and, you know, it's inexpensive, it's easy, it's global, it's scalable. Uh, so you, a busy professional needs to be on social media. Um, professionals can use social media as a tool to network, uh, to stay informed, to create content, demonstrate expertise, um, uh, to research prospects and, and recruits. Uh, and most of all, you can use social media to really build your rep reputation and your brand. Um, my suggestion is that before you jump in, um, you set your goals. What are you trying to accomplish on social media? You build a strategy for implementation, and then you create a system and a calendar uh, because consistency is really important. So I, I think the important points are to uh, share relevant and, and meaningful content and share it on a consistent basis. You want to share content that that your network would expect you to share. So for me, for example, I share content about networking and connecting, uh, virtual networking, et cetera. For me to share content um, uh, or to, to comment on legal stuff would not be appropriate because I'm not an attorney. Um, so social media is just part of it. And alone, uh, it, it can't get you to where you need to be. but um, it should be part of your business development plan. And lastly, I would say, uh, like I did at the beginning, if you're not on social media, you can bet that your competition is and you're going to lose out. So it's not a question of if you should be. It's a question of 
how to build that strategy and implement that strategy. Interesting. <clears throat> and again, folks, I'm going to ask one or two more questions and we're going to open it up to the audience. So if you have a question, get ready. And I think there's a button you can push uh, to ask your question. Uh, Jim, what would your response be? And I hear it a great deal with clients and so forth. I just don't have time. I don't have the time. You know, it takes so much time. I'm not seeing results. You know, you, I, mean, I hear what you're saying. It takes, you know, it, you got to stick with it. It's a marathon. It's not a sprint. What do you say to those people? I don't have the time. What's your well, response? we all have the time. It's, it's a matter of what we choose to do with that time. So I think that's a, that's a poor excuse. And every now and then I catch myself saying that as well. You do have the time, but you have to prioritize, prioritize how to use that time. So I think, uh, I think for uh, someone who's involved in business development, I think you need to spend a lot of time on a strategy and on implementation and on you know, calendaring those events and, and the activities that you need to complete in order to reach your goals. Folks, I can't even emphasize how important that comment is. We all do have the time. It's the allocation and understanding what are our priorities. You know, just like you hear that good exercise, well, I just don't have the time to exercise. Well, if it's important for you, you'll make the time, whether it's early in the morning, whether it's a, when you can control your time, probably better than later in the uh, afternoon or early evening. It's the prioritization of making things happen. Great, great point. Steve, a question for you. We're talking about measured results. We're talking about data. We're talking about those type of things. In the current environment, in this crazy environment, what metrics or data uh, is the best indicators that you know for growth or the things that people, clients should be looking for? Mm -hmm. Comment on that. Yeah, so, you know, and believe it or not, this environment really hasn't changed the metrics of, of what you should be measuring, how you should be measuring those KPIs. Um, you know, over the last three to five years, uh, especially over the last three years, there's been this whole idea of what you see online isn't necessarily true. So creating uh, a, an ability to discern what you're seeing is extremely important. And that's why these metrics really haven't changed. Um, so, I mean, many of them, things like brand reputation, brand mentions on social media, uh, obviously your cost per lead and your client acquisition costs. Uh, one that a lot of organizations seem to forget about is the client lifetime value. Um, and that's really important because if your customer acquisition costs seem high, um, oftentimes it's because the lifetime value of the client is much higher than you expect it to be. Um, but with all that said, I think the most important metric to measure is brand experience. Uh, this is something that isn't just digital. It is an interaction that someone has with the brand of your organization at any level. It could be meeting an employee. It could be going on a website. It could be seeing you know, your signage. Uh, it could be social media posts, whatever it is. But you need to make sure that the brand experience is absolutely phenomenal. Uh, because ultimately that's what's going to create validation and trust and if that experience first and foremost isn't great that's going to be a huge huge hurdle to creating new revenue and additionally if it's not uniform that's going to be another huge hurdle because again with the idea of false information online you need to make sure that that uniformity exists um, otherwise you're trying to you know row your boat upstream or, or so to speak uh, so you really need to look at brand experience. And then after that, it's customer experience, which has a, a big part to play as well. So what is one or two things that uh, people listening in can do to make that brand experience phenomenal? Is there one or two or three things you can put your fingers on? Because I think it's a great point. Yeah. The first thing I would say um, is, you know, get a small focus group put together uh, around the segmentations or types of customers that you have. That's key because oftentimes as business leaders, we find it difficult to really think the way our, our clients think. Um, so get that external information and get all of that data to make educated decisions. Um, focus groups these days aren't that expensive to run. Uh, you can get a small smoke focus group online you know, of 25 or 30 people. You can ask very specific questions about the brand. You can put up things saying, you know, review our website, review our social media presence, and you'll get valuable, valuable information. Um, and oftentimes it's information from a perspective that you've never even thought of. It's, it's the idea of you don't know what you don't know. 
Interesting. I'm going to ask Chris to comment on that too. And then we're going to have some questions from the audience. So if you have a question, get ready, folks. Chris, your thoughts on what Steve was talking about, that brand experience. I mean, that certainly affects sales as well. Absolutely. And it's really, and I think it goes, and it, and it ties into uh, what Jim was mentioning earlier too, that brand is is not not just the sales team. Um, the, as a matter of fact, it's, it's quite the opposite. Um, one of my favorite quotes, the sales team is not the whole company, but the whole company is the sales team. It's getting everyone on board. Uh, a company that has 40 employees, for example, and they have um, you know, X amount in marketing, maybe between marketing and sales, maybe there's, I don't know, eight employees in marketing and sales, just throwing a number out there. Well, the other 30 uh, or 28, 22 employees, whatever the numbers is, are, you have to think to yourself, what can they do? What's their reputation? A, are they on social media? And if they are, are they, do they have the company, uh, the actual company listed correctly on their, on their profile? Do they like and share what the company is doing? Are they engaging out there? That's one thing. And really to understand that whole branding aspect is, is really, are they um, able to communicate with each other internally? Do they understand the brand? Do they understand the mission, the vision of the company? So you have everyone on the same page speaking the same language makes a huge difference. Doug, can I add something for uh, to this conversation here about branding real quick? Yeah, Jim, Jim, let Jim comment, and then we're going to ask, open it up to the audience. Go ahead, Thank Jim. you. Just a, a reminder that your brand is not what you think it is. Your brand is what people say about you when you leave the room. Um, and when you think about your brand, consider what do you do that's different and better than others? How do people describe you? And what do people ask you for? That will help you define your brand. Well, very well stated. And I can't emphasize enough of the concept of this brand experience. You know, Jim is very well stated. Okay. We have any questions from the audience? Um, here we go. Greg White. Uh, I have, uh, I'm uh, moderating the, uh, uh, the Q&A uh, over here, and uh, we've got a couple of people that have questions. I'll ask the first one. Um, how different do you think the extended new normal um, is going to be? Uh, and I, I think, uh, you know, from my perspective, it's going to be different for uh, many of these different businesses. Uh, I am in the uh, uh, event business, so we are kind of with entertainment, theaters, um, you know, artists, uh, performing artists, uh, where we are at the tail of it. Uh, we're going to be the last to recover. Um, but I think for everybody, it's going to be a new normal extended after once, you know, once there is even a vaccine uh, out for COVID uh, uh, and uh, on, I don't think it'll ever be the same exactly as it was pre-COVID, but I'm just wondering what the panelists might think uh, uh, that new normal looks like for various businesses. Craig, before we ask the panel to answer that and whoever wants to take that, and you talk about you're in the entertainment phase, so you're going to be the last one, just like hotels and all that, you know, to finally recover. What are you doing as a businessman to survive? What are you doing in these last three, three and a half months? And like you said, it may be another three, four, five months, maybe longer. What are you doing to make sure you survive as a business? Well, we've uh, pivoted to virtual, uh, to digital completely digital, uh, and we've, uh, you know, acquired new tools, new strategies, uh, and we're also, uh, we, we stopped our marketing and our SEO and our, our marketing strategy temporarily, and I want to uh, stress that because I believe that that's the most important thing to lead with um, when you're, especially if you're pivoting and you're trying to find new business and new clients. So we've stopped it temporarily while we get our ducks in a row and our technology and our uh, marketing strategy together. Uh, Steve was talking about earlier that strategy has got to come first, and then we're going to re uh, uh, re uh, start our our tactics uh, to attract uh, the clients that we're we're trying to attract. Uh, in the meantime, um, we've had to do projections for every scenario um, to see how long can we survive, how can how long can we go at different scales 
Um, right. You know, you have to have maybe less uh, of a payroll right now, um, but we're, you know, bringing candidates in um, and putting them on deck, so to speak, so that when we're ready, we can bring them on. And it could go a lot of different ways for us. Uh, we have a lot of stuff in the pipeline right now, which it could be a tidal wave of business for us. It could actually be better than it was before, revenue-wise. <laughs> it could also go the total opposite way, and we could be looking at closing the doors in a year from now. Uh, but we have a runway, so to speak, um, uh, and that's our plan, um, to go with that runway and keep doing the projections and, and matching them to our different um, uh, levels of operation, scale of operation, uh, to see how long we can extend that runway uh, and still be viable. Uh, and then ultimately be successful to thrive you and you're talking about adapting i mean that's the name of the game you got to be fluid you got to be able to adapt to the marketplace who wants to take steve's uh, i mean craig's question uh, jim yeah well adaptability you're right because we we have two choices we either complain about zoom fatigue or we embrace it and the fact is that we we now have uh, eliminated or greatly reduced our commuting so we're much more efficient and effective working from home, having Zoom calls and phone calls, et cetera. So embrace it because it's not that bad. And frankly, what would we do if we didn't have the technology today uh, that would allow us to have Zoom calls and, and webinars and things of that nature? So I say embrace it. Um, for me, We've had, I've had some great success with some of our, uh, my virtual uh, me, uh, meetings and webinars and, and platforms. I see them continuing um, and I see for, for others, uh, I would call it almost a hybrid situation where maybe there are some in-person events that are live streamed. So if you don't feel comfortable attending in person, you can be there virtually. So I would call that a hybrid situation, but uh, I think we've, we've, learned an awful lot through the last three months. And a lot of this is good stuff that's going to continue and be a part of our, our regular workday. I think we learned the magic word there, adaptability. you got to be able to adapt to what's happening in the marketplace. Steve or Chris, you want to comment on, Chris, be, um, on Craig before we go to the next question? Sure. I'll, I'll chime in for a minute. The and really, when I think about, again, that, that quote unquote new normal, that it's, it's, it's almost tough to say that anymore because it's out there so often. Um, but it's, it is going to be dramatic. I think 2021, when you really think about everything coming into play, um, there are companies out there that um, are going to be starving for good talent. Uh, there are the, there's a ton of talent out there in the marketplace that has been displaced, unlike really uh, any time before. Um, and, and with that, there's going to be changes to business from a, from a standpoint of businesses that focus on what they can control, what they can't control. I mean, quite frankly, I think of Darwinism. There's survival of the fittest. Those that don't adapt, those that continue to wait on the sidelines to determine what's going to happen, that's going to be the challenge. Um, businesses are going to, next year, small businesses, to be very direct, are going to face higher unemployment insurance costs because there's so much unemployment going out right now right. Um, that uh, people aren't going back to work because of that extra $600. So it's there's a lot of things at play that business owners and companies need to get ahead of uh, so they can pivot and can adapt without focusing on uh, on the negative aspects of it, but what they can control. And folks, we can't emphasize enough that exactly what Chris just said on the positive attitude, you know, we call that op uh, optimism, you know, and I, I talked about before active optimism, where you expect things to happen in a positive way. So important to keep that positive attitude in your outlook. Craig, do we have another question from the audience? Yes, uh, we have Amanda Giannotti. Hey there. Um I heard Steve talking about tactics, and my question is, if there is an out-of-town competitor marketing heavy in your area using tactics like Google AdWords, or I'm not even sure what all they're using, what tactic is best from a brick-and-mortar um, standpoint to combat that or to rank higher? Yep. So uh, it's a great question, Amanda. We see that often. So if someone is just what we call blitzing or overloading the market in an advertising space, uh, first, 
oftentimes it's best not to try to compete. You know, if they can outspend you, they probably will outspend you. Uh, and then when you compare that information to what your cost per lead and cost per customer acquisition is, you may be spending $20 to make $5 and it's just not worth it. So you have to find an area where that competitor has decided not to push their services or push their brand. Um, right now, I would tell you that uh, your Google business profile is probably going to be more important than anything else if you're talking about Google specifically. Um, and your organic rankings is going to be more important. Uh, so your Google business profile, um, it, it basically it runs off of online reviews and how complete the profile actually is. So when people are looking for your specific services, your specific products, uh, your profile will show up with your positive reviews. Um, and, and your competitor isn't going to be able to outspend you in that area. Um, so that's where I would recommend you spend most of your effort currently. Thank you. That answer, that answer your question, Amanda. Great to see you. Good to see you too. Hi, man. And do we have anybody else that wants to ask a question? Beth? Okay, let me ask, let me jump back in here again. Uh, Chris, if you could talk about some of the critical changes. We talked about the pre COVID, we talked about COVID and hopefully post COVID that businesses need to consider when it comes to sales. You know, we're doing business in a certain way before, you're obviously adapting like we're talking to, like we're doing now. Hopefully down the road, things will change again. Tie all those things together if you could. Yeah, absolutely, Doug. And I think I think one thing I'll focus on with, with that question is um, a mantra of no one of us is as smart as all of us, right? And from a, from a sales perspective, a lot of times they're silos, as I mentioned before. There's a sales team going out selling, uh, let's just call it a, a company that's a manufacturer, an engineering team that's doing engineering, uh, manu the uh, manufacturing team that's manufacturing, procurement, et cetera. Well, one of the trends we're seeing right now is that uh, from a team sale approach, more so than in the past, to have a really good firm understanding of that customer's needs. For example, um, and we're working with this with, with several clients uh, right now in great detail. Uh, one thing is that, um, let's say the sales team goes out and it commits to a customer, say it's a global operation, X amount of quantity um, for a product or service. All of a sudden that time, get that lead time gets back to the home office. Engineering and supply chain are going, oh my gosh, they guaranteed four weeks. This is going to take eight weeks minimum. How could they do that? So there's infighting, there's all, you know, go on and on and on. So what's happening now is more understanding of a, on a pursuit, especially on a large enterprise pursuit, where there's a lot of money at stake in that pursuit um, and a lot of risk at stake, is to understand, okay, what are the potential client issues that might arise? What are the potential selling team issues? What are the potential finance and contract issues? And how do we get all those parties together in the very beginning to kind of map out what this looks like? I mean, I, I'll say a checklist, if you will. Uh, what could happen? What could go well? What could not go well? And you could also use that as a postmortem. Like, for example, if you get on an airplane, uh, which we used to do, remember that? Uh, you, get on, <laughs> you get on an airplane, imagine you're walking on that plane and all of a sudden you hear the pilot talk to the co-pilot and he says, you know what? I am tired of using this checklist. I'll, I, I think I think this is in good shape. We'll just fly across the country without without doing this pre-flight checklist. How are you feeling about getting on that plane? <laughs> I don't think so. Right. Mm -hmm. I don't care if the pilot has 25 years experience, 30, whatever. So it's but sometimes we can wing it in the sales process with more experience and we can wing it in different ways without following that process and, and breaking down those silos. So I think that's a that's an important trend to embrace. Great point. Craig, do we have somebody else? Uh, yes, we do. Uh, so I, uh, we have Beth Berman. Hello, everybody. Nice to see you. Uh, my question is, um, and ju just as a brief introduction, I had to audit the beginning of this, but I was listening. <laughs> um, I am an e a pro EOS implementer. Um, and my question is, how do you believe you hold 
the entire organization together around a cohesive message um, to so that you can get everybody selling in the marketplace. In, in EOS, we have something called the three uniques where we have three themes that differentiate and elevate you over your competition. Two of them may be the same. The combination of the third differentiates you from your, um, from your competition. And I'm wondering what your views on that are in terms of making sure that the entire organization is able to articulate that. Before somebody answers, for the audience, Beth, tell people what EOS stands for. Ah, thank you. It's the entrepreneurial operating system, really focused on growing and scaling businesses with a practical proven system. By the way, nice to see you. <laughs> Who wants to take that? I'm happy to jump in uh, and kick that off. I mean, it, and that's a great question. Um, it really, it really involves um, a very close connection to the mission and vision of that organization. Uh, a lot of companies, um, you may have some things on the wall or, or, you know, some different words, but do they truly resonate with it? Do they have, has the mission been updated? Uh, is the vision been updated? Do people understand it? Do they have uh, team meetings around it so they understand what that is? And I think that's step one. Without that um, and continually revisiting that, then people get lost uh, around that purpose and then the culture is, you know, it gets lost and culture is going to be even more lost now uh, unless that senior leadership is involved on engagement of people and how do you have that water cooler conversation when you know everything's virtual so i think it starts with mission vision yeah i would say uh hi beth i would say that it's all a part of the brand story so um and and it, sh it has to come from the top down so leadership has to buy into it um it's part of the brand story uh, and as such, it has to be authentic and it has to be consistent. So the messaging has to be, you know, everywhere it can be and everybody has to embrace it, uh, especially top down. Yeah. And uh, to add on to that, um, Jim, I also think that it needs to be practiced. Uh, and as executives, we need to test for it throughout the organization. You know, if for things to become that ingrained, it has to be done multiple times over and over and over again. Uh, and if the organization doesn't somehow implement a system that causes people to practice it, uh, then it's just going to be forgotten. You know, I remember an interesting story way back when of a uh, individual, I think it was in the Dallas chapter, he was running a hundred million dollar company and he just, you know, got everything together with his strategic plan. He came up with a new mission statement and everything, had it on the wall and was trying to drive it through his organization, exactly what you guys are talking about. And he'd go into the back of the warehouse and he'd ask somebody because, you know, everybody was involved, you know, from he had he had hundreds and hundreds of employees and go back into the warehouse. And he says, tell me what my mission statement is or our mission statement for the company. The guy didn't know. Finally, after two or three or four people, one person knew he gave that person one hundred dollars. Next day, when he went back there, everybody knew the mission statement. <laughs> everybody was on board. I mean, it's a little thing, maybe a little quirky, but again, it got to get the buy-in. that answer yeah. your question, Beth? Or It, it does. And um, if it's okay, I'd, I'd kind of like to build on that, that um, we say vision without traction is hallucination. And the, um, the, it, it, it is that repeated conversation, having it be a two-way conversation with our people, um, having all marketing and sales activities focus on those three themes um, and, and, you know, rewarding, making sure that every, rewarding your people for doing that, you know, that story, I've heard that story a bunch of times. Um, yeah, it, I think adding to that and bringing it as part of the system and a systematic approach to it absolutely makes it come together. So good points all around. Thank you. Yeah, that reward process is so very important. You know, we just heard recently, you know, Jack Welch, the former chairman of uh, General Electric passed away, you know, several months ago. 
I don't know whether you, anybody's uh, read his book way back when. I think it was Jack Straight from the Gut. And he talked about, in, in the book, he talked about your employees are your most important assets that walk in the door every day, not your biggest expense. So when these tough times are like we have it now, you know, again, we have to adapt. But is there any way, and again, that's what the PPP money came in to try to, you know, be able to retain your employees. It's so important. And those top comp companies that understand their culture, understand their brand, the stuff we're talking about, they understand their employees too. We can't emphasize enough how important they are because, you know, they make the things happen. It's like Chris was talking about the salespeople and the sales managers and so forth. That's get the buy-in from everybody all the way down the line. Can't emphasize that enough. Beth, you good? I'm good. Thank you. Craig, do you have anybody else? I think we lost Craig. Steve. Oh. Hello. Hi, this is Simone from Vehicles for Change. How are you? Um, Hi, Simone. Hi, Simone. Hey, thank you so much for the great information. Working on the nonprofit side, you all talked a lot about um, some great ideas and so forth for the profit side. But nonprofit side, when you're marketing and asking, hey, can you give us money? Can you give us cars? How would you recommend doing that in a time when so many people are losing jobs, so many people are in need also, to turn around and say, yes, we know you're in need, but can you still turn around and help us? How do you all recommend handling such a sensitive situation? Great, great question. So Doug, I can take that. Go ahead, Steve. Um, it's funny, Simone. I was at a meeting this morning um, at a friend's house, and uh, one of the common themes we heard is that a lot of people, because they're not going out as much, they have a lot a lot of additional funds, and they have increased their philanthropic activities. So uh, even though it seems like a, a rather um, scary time financially for a lot of people, I think there's also a lot of people out there that have a lot more to give as a result. Uh, but as far as the strategy and the tactics behind it and the timing and whatnot, you know, I've spoken in front of large audiences about why I believe marketing actually has a marketing problem. Many people and companies, they believe marketing simply to be the creation of advertisements and, and different uh, marketing messages. And that's really not the case. It, the word marketing, you should start to replace it with the word communications. Uh, for communications to build businesses, and in your case, philanthropic activities and, and add to that revenue, you need to use all five functions of communications. And those five functions are, include marketing, but it's also advertising, PR, it's branding, and it's reputation management. Uh, and specifically in the form of nonprofit organizations, you need to pull at those heartstrings, so to speak. And you need to approach people in different ways in order for them to feel an emotional engagement. And you can only truly activate that emotional engagement when you're using all five functions of communications. Um, so that's my recommendation to you. You know, look at the hours in your week. Um, I think there's about 168 hours in every seven day week or something like that. Carve out a few of them and say, OK, what am I doing for each five of those functions of communication? And how does it tie back to our overall communications strategy? Great, great point, Steve. And, and Simone, we talked a little bit about your company because Marty's one of our sponsors with Vehicles for Change. And Steve hit it right on the head about attaching it to the heartstrings. Uh, you know, I, I know it's it's when you hand the keys over, when you donate a car, you give enough money that you can actually donate the car to a needy family. And when you do that and that person starts sobbing and crying and you're like the biggest philanthropist in the world to that person, you have changed a life. I mean, it's one of the most powerful things that I have ever experienced. I got to tell you that in, from a business perspective because it's no longer business you know you've made an emotional connection to somebody and that person will never forget that moment and neither will you because you have changed a life a kid who couldn't uh, attend after school activities because his mother or her father didn't have a car didn't have modes of transportation what you guys have is so vitally important you change lives you make a difference in people's lives and i think if you get that message across to your marketplace and your your clientele or whoever whoever the audience you're trying to reach 
it's got to work. Chris, you wanted to say something? Yeah, I mean, to go right along with what, what you and Steve just said, it's so incredibly important and everything you said was resonated so much. And and when you think about the the difference, as you mentioned, from nonprofit to you know to to for profit, the fundamentals are the are absolutely the same. When it comes to making an ask uh, for philanthropic investment, uh, as Steve mentioned, it's really about that ROPI. What's that return on philanthropic investment? There are so many people out there in the nonprofit worlds that are making asks all the time, but they're making asks based on kind of why they think that person may want to give. But until you get that emotional connection, until you understand what that is, then it's, the, it's you sound like everybody else. It's asking questions, digging deeper. About 10 years ago, I think we really had our first experience with a large hospital organization really talking about that, in particular, why their funds were down in certain units, like the NICU unit, for example. Well, it's, there just wasn't a connection. It was more of a give us money because we need it to support all this great, beautiful stuff versus that direct connection to a family member, to somebody they know, uh, and really understanding how they could add value to that versus, you know, just giving money for something. And so it's so important. Jim. I just want to say uh, uh, the work that, that you guys and Marty, the work that you guys do is fantastic. You, what you have that many of us don't have, you have great stories to tell. So I, if I were you, I would tell those stories and make sure that your customers are the heroes of those stories. So it's not about you and vehicles for change. It's about your customers as the heroes. And it goes back to the, uh, the word that I used early on, which is empathy. No greater time to show empathy than right now. And I think Steve is right about, uh, you know, people who are, you know, maybe not spending as much money as they were. Um, and now they maybe have more funds for philanthropic um, endeavors. Now's a great time. Tell your story and make your customers the heroes of those stories. Does that help, Simone? You got a great organization. Jim is exactly right. You got to get those stories out there and, and let people feel, feel the impact that they can make on somebody else. I mean, it's just unbelievable th thought when you think you can change somebody's life for the better. I mean, it's so, so powerful. Thank you for that question. That was super. Yeah. Guys, we're going to wrap it up. I'm going to leave you. Uh, if you just want to say one final. Okay. Time for we'll squeeze it in. Is there time for one more? <laughs> okay, this is George Simmons. First of all, I'd like to thank the panel for for the feedback and, and, and suggestions they give us, have given us. But one thing I like for a lot of the consultants, whether you're in sales or whether you're in marketing, is also to consider you guys have to change too. I mean, you're giving us valuable advice. And I'd like for you to comment on whether or not you're willing to change some of your business models in the sense that like professional services, which uh, on, it came up with great ideas for a company and these ideas typically require some cost savings and things of that nature. And they get paid out of the fact that their results, their, their suggestions produced results. Uh, similarly with marketing, you know, we have a lot of customers who, who have been told, this is what you need to do for marketing, et cetera, et cetera. They say, I have no funds. I have no more resources. I really like the product or service you're offering. You know, is there a consideration for marketing and other consultants to think about Hey, how about if I give you the services and I get paid out of the profitability or revenue and profitability that these suggestions that you're giving us uh, uh, work in my business? A shared arrangement concept. Anybody want to take that? You dumped the panel, George. I'll, 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 I think it's a great question, George, and it's something that is a tough one. It really is because there are so many moving parts with that. And I think that depending on the situation at a surface level, uh, just imagine prospect A and, and, and a marketing consultant company, a professional service company, B. at surface level, you don't know whether or not that arrangement might make sense. It's not until really digging, asking a lot of questions, understanding the backdrop, understanding everyone that's involved until you realize that maybe there's a good option for that. 
but without a lot of digging at surface level, there's no uh, way that I could say, oh yeah, from Jump Street, offer offer something like this. Uh, but there is there are different ways to have, as, as Doug mentioned, a shared arrangement. And I can chime in on that as well, Doug. Uh, you know, the data says um, over the last you know ten years or whatnot, anyhow that generally in those situations, at some point, one of the parties begins to feel as though they're being taken advantage of um, yeah. or being treated unfairly. Uh, and as professional service companies and consultants, uh, it's our goal to make sure that no one ever feels like they're being taken advantage of. So keep that in the back of your mind. I'm sure others um, have that same sentiment. Uh, and that might be why you don't see those arrangements more commonly. Mm -hmm. yeah. Great, Great point. point. Yeah. Thank you, George. Fantastic question. Guys, we're going to wrap it up. 15 seconds each. What is the one thought you want to leave our audience with? Who wants to go first? Chris, go first. 15, 20 seconds. Uh, certainly, Doug. Well, well thank you. Uh, number one, I enjoyed this thoroughly. and Thank you, Jim and Steve, uh, as well. I think really, again, it's it's about like, going back to the beginning, being there. Uh, be present. Um, and, and rather than saying, I should do something, take action and do something. Uh, and someone told me a long time ago when I said I should do this, they said, stop shooting on yourself. <laughs> and that's always stuck with me. So that's one thing I'll leave. Great. Steve, last thoughts, 15, 20 seconds. Yeah, I'd like to point out that most of the things we're talking about today, most of the ideas and concepts um, are concepts that people have been talking about for a long time. Um, I, I think Chris hit the head, you know, nail right on the head in that the reason many companies are failing is because they procrastinated in innovation years ago. Um, so make sure you're doing something to get the data, to understand what innovation looks like in your industry, and then move forward with it. You know, we're current, currently living in a world of big data. Any information you need is out there. I think 90% of all the world's data was generated in the last two years. And, and I know we're currently generating over two and a half quintillion bytes of data every day. So the data is out there. Just understand that you need to push the envelope and be innovative because something's going to happen again in the future. It might not be for another five years, maybe 10 years, but you need to be prepared for it. Thank you, Steve. Jim Rees. 15, 20 seconds, final thoughts. Thank you, Doug and the panel. Uh, my my sound bite is that um, don't be salesy. As Chris said before, people like to buy, they don't like to be sold. So in your uh, sales process, be prepared, be likable, be authentic, be empathetic, be client focused, and most of all, be a listener. Be interested, not interesting. If you're interested, it means you're curious, you're asking a lot of questions. If you're interesting, you're talking about yourself too much. Great thoughts. Again, thank you all very, very much. It's been tremendous information that we have given to our audience. And audience, please remember the concept, be adaptable. You can get through this tough times. I guarantee it. Thank you all. See you next meeting. Bye -bye Thanks, now. everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Doug.